These are the uncertainty propagation rule that we've given you for propagating uncertainty in this course. You notice that we do this funny math operation that looks a little bit like Pythagoras, which we call adding in quadrature. You can see that it's common to each of these rules. Now, despite the similarity, it actually has nothing to do with Pythagoras. It arises from a totally different mechanism. And this video is supposed to give you a quick, simple, graphical demonstration of where that kind of comes from. So let's take the simple example of simply adding two numbers with uncertainties. Now at this point, we assume that you're familiar with how to come up with the uncertainty for a given measurement based on the tools, the method, and the object that you're measuring. Denoted here as a and delta A, B and delta B. And of course, when we do calculation with these numbers, in this case, adding them up, hopefully it's not so surprising that the calculated answer should also have an associated uncertainty with it. And this process of relating the uncertainty and the answer with the uncertainty of the things you're calculating with, it's called uncertainty propagation. We're propagating or moving forward the uncertainty. Now, each of the two numbers A and B then, with the associated uncertainty, can be represented visually on the number line. And they can be represented as a range. For A, you have a certain number in the middle, which is three. From that middle number, the associated uncertainty says that we can go 0.2 to the right and point two to the left, like so. Similarly, you can do the same thing for B. And then given these two numbers with their ranges, when we add them up, what do we expect in terms of the uncertainty in the end? Now, hopefully it's not too surprising that C, the middle number, should just simply be the sum of the two middle numbers of A and B, so in this case, 3.0 second plus 5.0 seconds, giving 8.0 seconds. The bigger question is, what is that range? A simple way that you might think of is simply add up these two uncertainties. Because why not, right? Uh, if the largest possible number for A is here, 3.2, and the largest possible number for B is 5.3, if you sum that up, the largest possible number should be 8.5. Therefore, 8 plus or minus 0 0.5 seems like a reasonable thing. However, this simple method of just simply adding up delta A plus delta B tends to overestimate the uncertainty in many cases. While we won't get into the full mathematical rigor of how exactly this comes about, We'll briefly go through the basics here with a simple graphical demonstration. The first major concept here is that when we quote plus or minus, usually what we mean is that we still think it's a little bit more likely for the number, say, A, to be near the middle than out towards the edges of the ranges. So if you kind of graph out, quote unquote, the likelihood of where A is, it's we have higher confidence that it's near the middle number rather than out towards the edges. And to represent this, we often use the bell curve, which is properly named the Gaussian distribution, or sometimes because it's so common, the normal distribution. And the normal distribution models most random processes that gives rise to uncertainty fairly well. Here, a higher value on the graph means a higher likelihood of the number being kind of within this range than within, say, that range. So saying that it's more likely near the middle than out the edges. The bell curve has a specific form because there's a well-behaved mathematical function that forms its shape. It looks a little intimidating, but what you have is you have this mu, which is your middle value, right? So you have mu right here. And then to characterize the width of the curve, it's given by this thing called sigma or standard deviation, which is telling me it's plus this much and minus that much. Now this particular mathematical form, because it's so common, 
most of the time when you see plus or minus is often this is just sigma instead of what we might otherwise think of as the range of the maximum to minimum value. That's why I've drawn the, the curves the way they are. In terms of what we mean by that is then within the first standard deviation on each side of the middle number, say this chunk here, if you integrate the curve properly, you find that within one sigma, plus or minus one sigma, you encompass about 66% of the likelihood. If you extend that out to two sigma, so if you go as far as two sigma, that tends to include 95% of the likelihood. Now these numbers kind of seem arbitrary, 66, 95, but that's because it kind of is, right? It's a result of this particular mathematical form and the fact that this is the number that characterizes the width, and so we use this by convention. So then with these two curves, we can actually generate kind of the distribution of the sum by dividing these curves up into specific regions and then picking particular points on it by random. So in this case, I randomly picked out all these dots, and again, you will see that there's more dots near the middle, so it's more likely for the number to show up near the middle than out to the edges. But by random chance, I picked 2.9 here and 4.7. So then the sum, it's at 7.6. And we can repeat this many times. In fact, I'm going to repeat it 100 times just so to build up the actual distribution. And after 100 trials, that's what we have. It's not perfect because it's only 100 trials, but you can still kind of see that it sort of looks like a bell curve. However, if we naively draw a bell curve with a standard deviation, which is a sum of the original two standard deviation, 0.5, you find that it doesn't quite fit the shape very well. It seems like this is there's some missing gap here, and there's a bunch of extra bunch in near the middle. What's kind of happening is the likelihood of the sum to be out here near the extreme requires both of these distribution to be picking the same extreme on the same side. Picking extremes on both of these distribution are both not very likely. So to have two not very likely events happen at the same time the resulting likelihood is even less than what you might expect. On top of that, even if one distribution picks up on the extreme, the other distribution can pick up on the extreme on the other side. Both of these mechanisms work to put more values in the middle. So there's a lower likelihood of things happening towards the edges and a higher likelihood of the value being near the middle. What this effectively do is it squeezes our bell curve to be a little bit tighter, which is why I was saying that if you just simply sum up the two standard deviation, you overestimate the resulting standard deviation. The correct answer comes from this particular mathematical form with the e to the sigma square like that. Uh, we won't get into all the math, but as you can see, if we use the addition by quadrature method and plot this purple bell curve with this standard deviation given from quadrature, it fits our data much, much better. So even without rigorously proving it, hopefully this demonstration gives you some sense of why the distribution of the sum is a little narrower than simply summing up the two standard deviations. So for our purposes, when we apply the rule, we would add by quadrature as such. We won't necessarily look at the bell curve every single time, but we make use of this addition by quadrature method. Thus resulting in our rule for summing and subtracting to be like that. Similar argument applies for the other cases for multiplication, division, etc. But there we're going to be dealing with relative uncertainty instead of absolute uncertainty.